Well, at this time, I'd invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to our scripture passage for this morning, and that is Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, as we continue our study through this book, and uh, you'll find that in your pew Bibles on page 1072. 1072. We come to the end of Paul's first missionary journey in this passage. He wraps it up and then he returns home. And uh, in that, we find instruction for how the church is to carry on the ministry of the church without the apostles uh, who have established them and how the Lord Jesus Christ provides men uh, for that purpose. So as we left off last week, Paul had just been stoned and then had gotten up and returned back into Lystra and the next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby, uh, some 60 or so miles away. And in verse 21, we pick up with the narrative. This is God's holy word. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain, to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. From Attilia, they sailed back to Antioch. For they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. They stayed there a long time with the disciples. There ends the reading of God's holy word. And as always, we are dependent on the Holy Spirit now to bless us through the preaching of his word. Let us pray for that grace this morning. Let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we rejoice that you are our God and our Father, and we rejoice that you are a good and gracious Father, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. O oh, Father, this morning, you who we call Abba, Father, because we are filled with your Spirit, we pray now that you would bless us through the preaching of your Word. Father, we come with hungering hearts, needing that living bread, and we pray, Lord, satisfy our souls this morning. We ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would descend on high, that He would fill our hearts and open our minds, and, and Father, that He would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And so be with us now in these moments where we sit under Your Word. Would You build us up and show us Christ, we pray. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, I suppose in typical warfare, most commonly at least, uh, the goal of warfare is gaining ground against your enemy, driving the enemy out, and then holding the ground. Uh, in typical warfare, you go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, you drive the enemy back, and then you seek to hold the ground. And of course, it's a pointless endeavor to gain ground, only to lose it again to the enemy. Uh, that is paramount to defeat, if you will, if you gain some ground and the enemy takes it back. I couldn't remember this week what documentary it was. It was many years ago, but I remember some documentary, I think it was on the Battle of the Bulge, where the fighting was so bad for so many days that uh, the Allied and the Axis forces were commenting how they would trade off foxholes. Uh, they would gain ground only to lose ground, and, and they were actually using each other's foxholes because it was back and forth. No one was able to hold the ground. In a situation like that, you must give everything you have, put all of your resources in place in order to not lose ground. Well, this morning, that's similar to what our passage is telling us many weeks ago when we kicked off Paul's missionary journey. We, we did so with the analogy of military bringing supply routes to make sure the gospel goes forward. And now those supply routes have been established. Paul and Barnabas had spent somewhere perhaps around two to maybe three years preaching the gospel and establishing a handful of churches. But now the question needs to be asked, will those churches hold their ground? 
Will those churches hold the ground or will they concede the ground and will they fade away as if they never were planted? And in order to ensure that that doesn't happen, our text shows us what Paul and Barnabas do. They literally retrace their steps, go back city by city, church by church, in order to build the saints up, to give elders to them, to ensure that in the midst of the suffering that is certain to come, they are well prepared for the onslaught of Satan's attack. Uh, they go back, and our text shows us they spend time encouraging the believers and rallying them with the truth of God's word in order to bolster them for the long haul. And then we see that they return home. They close out the first missionary journey and they give their report. And all of this, we need to understand, is Christ's grace to establish a church. And that's our goal this morning, to see how the church is not only established, but how it endures. How a church like New Haven URC will not just be planted for 20 years, but how New Haven URC will be planted for 60 or maybe for as many years until Christ comes back. What is necessary for us to endure? And this morning, we learn that what is necessary is that the church is sustained by the word ministered through shepherds. That's our theme this morning. The church, our church, every church, is sustained by the word ministered by shepherds. And I have three points that I want to look at with you. First of all, we see that the church is sustained by Scripture. It is sustained by Scripture as that which encourages the believers Secondly, it is sustained by shepherding, by elders equipped for the task. And then thirdly, it is sustained by sharing. And simply what I mean by that is that the churches are not independent of one another, but they are linked. And as they share with the church in Antioch, it brings together the union of the church as they pray for one another. So let's take those in turn. First of all, the church is sustained by Scripture. Look at verse 21. It is Scripture preached that builds up and makes disciples. Verse 21, speaking of Paul and Barnabas in Derby, they preach the good news in that city and won a large number, and notice the description here, a large number of disciples. Paul and Barnabas now have gone to the next city. Paul, as we ended with last week, no doubt has bumps and bruises as he was stoned almost to death. Almost certainly a miracle had raised him up almost from the dead. They carry on, and what do we see them doing? We see them doing the exact same thing that we have seen them do in every passage prior. They go to the town, and they preach the gospel. They preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And notice your text. Once again, they go, and a large number is converted. We are reminded that that is how disciples are made. Disciples are made in one way, that is through the sharing of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, the teaching of the gospel is what transforms people. It is, as we have seen already in a number of churches, it is the Holy Spirit's use of the preaching of the word to transform the heart, bringing a person from deadness to life unto conversion that brings them not only into membership of the church, but it brings them into new life. And once again, be reminded, let's not pass over this too quickly. Notice that it's a large number. Let us be reminded of the graciousness of our Father. He is pleased to convert large numbers. His heart is to the lost. His heart is to convert. And once again, He converts a large number. Now, I want to highlight the fact that you notice that the preacher of the gospel makes new believers. And notice the title given to them, it is Disciples. The, the word here, disciple, in Greek literally just means learner or follower of a teacher. And here it is the same word given in the Great Commission. Remember that when Jesus ascended to heaven in Matthew 28, he tells the church to do what? Go forth and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to do all that I have commanded you to observe. And lo, I am with you to the end of the age. That's exactly what we see here. Paul and Barnabas preach the gospel, and we are told that they make disciples. They don't just make converts, that's good, but they make disciples. A disciple is one who not only is brought into the faith, but continues in the faith. It is one who is brought in by the word and continues through the word. A disciple is one who looks to the Lord Jesus Christ, sits at his feet, and looks to him as the chief teacher. It is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that is exactly what we need to note here. It is the word that keeps disciples. Jesus said, teach them all that I commanded. And I think the point is simply this. It is the word of God that makes disciples and is the word of God that continues to grow disciples. It is the gospel through the word of God that makes all of this happen. It is the word of God preached. Notice, secondly, the scripture also is a source of encouragement. Look at verse 21 again. Then they return to Lystra, and Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. And there it is. Paul and Barnabas, instead of going on eastward to make new church plants, instead turn back and they go through cities to which they had already planted churches. Uh, let us be reminded of those cities. In each of those cities, they met opposition. In each of those cities, especially Lystra, remember that Paul was stoned there. And so they're going back to cities where they are known. They're going back to cities where their faces would have been recognized. And don't miss the point. They're going back to cities where there are a number of people who hate them. Now, it's interesting. One commentary noted that the easier path back to Antioch would have been just to continue walking east. There would have had been better roads. There would have been no hostility from people who hated them. And they would have gone through Paul's hometown of Tarsus. But that is not what they did. They did not take the easy road, but instead they took the harder road. And we need to ask the question this morning, why did they go back? The answer to that question is they go back because their mission was not only to plant churches. Their mission was to establish and to sustain the churches in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so their mission was to plant churches among the Gentiles, and so they returned back to build them up. Now, in our text, we're told that they minister to the disciples in each of those churches, and they do two things there. Notice, first of all, that they strengthen them. They strengthen them. The idea is of strengthening them or making them more firm in the faith, bolstering their hearts, bolstering their souls to continue walking steadfastly after the Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, and closely connected to strengthening, they also encourage them. They encourage them. The idea of encouragement here is of spurring them on to faithfulness in the faith and in Christ. Listen, I think that we, we understand here, or at least we should say here, that Paul and Barnabas understand the Christian life. Paul and Barnabas know enough about the Christian life to know that once you become a Christian, it's not all beds and roses, or beds of roses, however the saying goes. To be, become a Christian is to enter into a battle. To become a Christian is to be converted from a world that, that will let you go your own way, to come unto Christ, to be a pilgrim, an outsider, one in whom the world does not tolerate, and to whom Satan is daily seeking like a lion to destroy. Brothers and sisters, you and I woke up this morning not to a time of peace, but to a time of war. Until Christ comes back, the church will always be what we call the church militant. The church in the midst of opposition to a world that will hate us. And we need to live in light of that. But in light of that, we also see that Paul and Barnabas knew the saints need encouragement. Is it not true that the Christian life is so difficult we become downcast? We give in to our own sins and we begin to wonder, will I make it to the end? We, we have opposition, we have trials of many kinds. There are nights where Christians will stay up with tears in their eyes wondering, where is God in this? And Paul and Barnabas know this. And so they retrace their steps because they want to strengthen the saints. They want to strengthen the disciples. They want to guide them to the end. So here is the point this morning. It is the word of truth that the believers need. It is the word of truth and the encouragement. And notice here, I want to highlight something, that it is the word of promises. Notice that Paul and Barnabas say that we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. What was it through the word of God that they were holding out? It was the promise of the coming of Christ. Notice that. Paul and Barnabas strengthened and encouraged the church through the hope of the coming of Christ. They are reminded that Christ began his kingdom and he is continuing his kingdom. And one day he will finally establish the kingdom. So Paul and Barnabas hold that promise out, which is the longing of every believer, is it not? That we would be free of the afflictions of this world, that we would be free of our own sin, and that will finally happen when Christ returns. And yet... Paul and Barnabas did not shade over and soften the truth. Notice what they say, that we must go through many what? 
hardships. The Christian life is a pilgrimage of hardships before we enter finally the kingdom of God. So here's the point. And it's a word of truth that strengthens the heart of believers in the midst of suffering. That's the point. They don't shade the truth. They don't lie to them. They say there will be sufferings. But listen, it is the word of God and his promise that will sustain you to the end. The church endures through the scriptures and God's promise in it. Now, secondly, notice they're also sustained by shepherding. By shepherding. Notice what Paul and Barnabas do in verse 23. Verse 23, Paul and Barnabas appoint elders for them in each church. In each church, as they went city to city, not only did they encourage the saints, the second thing they did was appoint or ordain elders to carry on the work of ministering to the saints. In each church, they made sure that there were elders to take leadership. Uh, They knew that there needed to be men called up to lead and to care for the congregation when they left. And so we see they raised up elders. Now, from the rest of Scripture, we know the calling of elders is to be shepherds, to be spiritual caretakers, to be leaders in the church, to minister to the souls of the saints. That is exactly what Paul and Barnabas do. Paul and Barnabas ordain and appoint men who would feed the flock the word of God. Paul and Barnabas knew that that the feeding of the flock is not a one-time thing. It's a weekly thing. The church is needed every Sunday for elders to minister the word to the congregation. They needed spirit-filled elders who would care for the souls. And listen, Paul and Barnabas knew that trials and temptations would come, and they needed spiritual shepherds to, to, to protect the flock from the wolves who would assault them. And so they appoint elders. Now, you'll even notice in your pew Bible, there's a footnote. There's some debate over this. It says here that Paul and Barnabas appointed the men. There's some debate as to who actually elected them. Uh, It says Paul and Barnabas appointed them, but I think that we can find clarity from the rest of Scripture. Everywhere else in Scripture, we see that it is the congregation who elects the men and appoints them. In fact, actually, when the Greek word used here for appointment literally means to appoint by raising of a hand. So I think what's going on here is that the church elected these men, uh, examining them for the spiritual giftedness of being an elder, and Paul and Barnabas then laid hands on them and appointed them. I don't think it's right to say Paul and Barnabas selected them all alone. I think the church shared in the work. But either way, the point is simply this. There needed to be elders. There needed to be spirit-filled elders to shepherd the church. There needed to be men carrying on the word ministry. Now, they not only appointed the elders, notice that they also prayed for them. Verse 23, they appointed them with two things, prayer and fasting. Now, that may not sound unique to us. We may pass over that, but I don't think we should. Why is it that Luke wants us to understand that as these men are put up, they did so with the whole church pouring themselves out in prayer and fasting? I think the answer is simply this. These men were installed with prayer and fasting because these men are not enough to do the task. In this, we are learning that that every office bearer who has ever been ordained, every pastor, elder, and deacon, every man put forward cannot and is unable to do the job of ministry by himself. They are fellow sinners redeemed by grace. They are men still wrestling with their own sins, the world, the flesh, and the devil. These are men who need God's grace to do the job. These are men who need God's work, and so they pray for them. They bring them up, first of all, by praying, because they know these men are unable to do this unless Christ himself works through them. So they pray for their elders. They fast for their elders. This is a denying themselves likely of food. And the idea here is of pouring themselves out with urgency and acknowledgement by denying themselves their daily bread, bringing hunger to their bodies. They're acknowledging with urgency, God, we need this more than physical bread. God, we need you to build these men up so they feed us because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so the church fasts because they're acknowledging we need these men to minister to us by your grace that our souls would be fed the word of God. 
I think here's my point I'm trying to make. They're acknowledging in this prayer and fasting that Christ must use these men or else it will fail. Every office bearer is simply an instrument for the Holy Spirit to bless the church. That's what we learn here. They are weak men, but they are weak men who will be used mightily by God's grace to sustain the church. And then thirdly and lastly, notice that they commit them to the Lord. Verse 23 we see that with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. And again, this is so significant. Paul and Barnabas are committing not only elders here, but also the congregation to the Lord. They're heading on the road. And what we see here is Paul and Barnabas commit everything they had done to the Lord. And this teaches us that Paul and Barnabas knew that they were just instruments. These churches did not stand because Paul and Barnabas kept them standing. They knew that they stood because Christ kept them standing. And Paul and, Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas could leave the churches knowing with great assurance that the church would stand because Christ would ensure it. And how would they know that? How do we know that the church will stand to the end? And the answer is simply this. Christ shed his blood for the church and he will ensure that that which he gave his life for will continue on. That's the hope. How do you and I know that the word will continue to go forth? How do you and I know that the church will continue come what may? The answer is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ hung there on the cross, he did so. He poured out his blood, purchasing the pardon for each member of his people. And that which he died for, he will not give up lightly. Christ has huge vested interest in the continuing of the church. And so as Paul and Barnabas head out, and as they know trials will come, they know the church is in good hands. Not the hands of the elders alone. It is the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ through the elders that this church will stand. So we also learn another principle here. Christ is head of the church. It is Christ who calls the shots of the church, and it is Christ who is the sustaining grace of the church. So here's the point. We learned this morning that the congregation is strengthened by spirit-filled men continuing to shepherd under Christ. What a humbling reality, especially as one called to be a pastor. I'm reminded every Sunday that I stand before you, that unless the Holy Spirit is present, this sermon will do nothing. A sermon means nothing because Andrew Knott comes with some sort of wisdom. It will fall on deaf ears unless God himself, as we pray for and long for, blesses us. The congregation is dependent, each of us is dependent on the elders and the deacons to be spirit-filled. And as instruction to every office bearer here, it reminds us that you and I are accountable to our ministry because we answer to Christ directly for our ministry among his saints. Now, thirdly then, and lastly, we learn here that the church is also sustained by sharing. Let's read again verse 24 and 26. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Tilia. From Attilia they, set, or they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. We see here now that Paul, or rather Luke, almost hits the fast-forward button on the remote of his story, and he skips over a bunch of cities. You'll notice here that these are cities that Paul and Barnabas had not previously preached in. We're not sure why quickly passes over them. Apparently there's no notable conversions or even church plants, but it seems as if Luke wants to get our attention on what happens in Antioch. We see here that when they get back to Antioch after sailing, they do two things, or we see two things about the church. We're reminded that they're returning to a church that first of all committed them to the task. Remember many weeks ago, this church that they're returning to had committed themselves to share in the weight of this ministry. This was a church that had continued in prayer for Paul and Barnabas, likely gave financially to Paul and Barnabas, and they are now returning to the ones who had sent them. And that is the second thing. The church that had sent them with an urgency, notice this, of God's grace. This was a church that had a heart and a motivation of God's grace to spread out through the end. Here's the point. Paul and Barnabas are not alone in the mission work. They're going to a church that had united themselves in this. They had shared vested interest in the committing of the work. Notice verses 27 through 28. They report on this. 
And arriving there together, or on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them, and now he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Uh, simply put, it denotes the fact that they gave a lengthy report. In fact, the Greek is used here as an ongoing report. Almost certainly this would have taken many days for Paul and Barnabas to report. Likely on a Sunday, they would have stood before the church and gave a report. They would have reported on all the conversions that took place. They would have reported on all the churches and what had happened. And no doubt, they reported on all the opposition that they faced. But isn't it interesting? Antioch wanted to hear this. Antioch was eager to hear this. The church came, perhaps in the night, after they had spent a day at work, because they were eager to hear, what happened, Paul? Did, did the gospel go forth? Tell me about the brothers and sisters that were brought in. There was an eagerness because this church had a heart for the lost. And they shared the eagerness of the longing of not only establishing and planting, but continuing to unite with ministry with these churches. I think here's the point. We get from this the principle that each church is not independent, but that the church is to be united. This is why we as a federation uh, are united. We, we have brothers and sisters of churches throughout the country whom we get together because we see that the church is not one congregation, but it's many. And that we share together in the ministry of the word. We are linked together in prayer and in giving for this. And I think even more than that, the detailed report given here would have been showing the congregation the answers to prayers that they would have done. As they prayed for the work, now Paul and Barnabas come back and they say, this is how God answered your prayers. The church is sustained by the sharing and praying of the church. And I think we are reminded of one principle here. To be a Christian is not to be a Lone Ranger Christian. To be a Christian is to unite to a local congregation and to join that body, to be under an a, a, a assigned eldership, to care for your soul, because we share together in the walk of faith. And so they report and they encourage the church in Antioch. Now, as we close this morning, what does this mean for you and what does this mean for me by way of application? I have... Uh, Three things I want to mention in passing. First of all, by way of application this morning and teaching, that we learn that we are dependent on Christ's grace. This passage holds out the reality that we are dependent on Christ's grace for growth and to endure. Listen, church growth cannot be manufactured by us. We're living in a day and age where many churches get together, they have they have conferences, and many of these things are not bad in of themselves, but many people get together and they think that you can manufacture church growth. If we just do this, if we have this program, maybe if we, we shift this and we, we have lights and, and all of these other things, then we'll grow a church. But you see, when you come to Scripture, that's not how church growth happens. Church growth happens not because you change your program. It happens because you preach the Word and the Holy Spirit blesses it. Church growth happens when the church gets on its knees and pleads that the preaching of the word would bear fruit in not only your own heart, but the heart of the community. Listen, church growth happens when we eagerly yearn for it and pray for it. Are you doing that this morning? Listen, we're, we talk all about how our culture is changing around us and we bemoan that, but have you prayed urgently that that would change the sharing of the gospel? You see, we learn here that the only thing that's going to transform the culture, the only thing that's going to transform this community is that the Word of God goes out with power of the Holy Spirit. As I said at the beginning, we're reminded that you and I live in a war zone. Spiritually speaking, we live in a hostile area. We need Christ's grace through the preached Word every Sunday to carry us through. And we need the Holy Spirit's blessing to convert those in the world. Here's the point. This means you and I need to be praying for the blessing of the word every Sunday. And it means that we need to be praying for it in the community. And secondly, it means that we are looking to Jesus to grant that growth. Here's the point. We are to never forget the gospel that gives us assurance of this. As you long for this, be reminded Christ died for church growth and he longs to give it. Let us pray with eagerness that he would do that. Secondly, by way of application, it teaches us also 
that you must pray for your elders, your pastor, and your deacons. They committed these men with prayer and fasting because it was not the men who would do it. It was God through the men that would benefit the church. Office bearers, if they're honest with themselves, know that there's nothing we can do unless God blesses each office bearer. Congregation, you must be praying for every one of your office bearers every week that what Christ had called them to do would bear fruit in your own life. Application, you need to be praying for them. Pray for faithfulness. Pray for spirit-filled wisdom, shepherding hearts to care for them. And I think as well, prayer and fasting, we're told here when they elected these men. Let us be reminded, to fill the office of elder is not filling board members. You are filling men who need to be spiritually gifted in order to sit in that room to minister to your soul. I think it's significant when we, we, in a couple months, we have elections coming up. Is it not interesting that we should also be in urgent prayer for those men to be raised up to fill that office? Maybe even a time of fasting. If we are to join with this church and realize that we do not live by bread alone, let us urgently ask that God would bless the ministry of the word through the office bearers he brings up. Thirdly and briefly, but I really want to bring this out. We learned this morning the importance of church membership. We learn the vital importance of church membership. Again, we live in a day and age where people are not committed to the church. They think that church membership is simply paper. The Bible says otherwise. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. To be a Christian is to be plugged into a local congregation under the care of elders who know you and are seeking your good. The reason church membership is necessary is for spiritual growth. Young people, let me remind you, as I am so apt to do, it seems, if you are baptized here, you are a member of this congregation. And the elders know that and we care for you, and that you as a member of this church must realize that that is a huge privilege and a blessing. Everyone here who is a member realize that it is a privilege that you are here and it is accountability in your walk with Christ. Simply put, membership is not a paper. It is something where you unite with the body of Christ and he, through his elders, care for your soul. So brothers and sisters, let us thank God for his care for the church and pray for his ministry among us. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the church. We thank you for your blessing of the church. We thank you for your spirit's work in and through the church. We pray, Lord, that as we've seen through each of these churches, that you would be present among us. Give us a longing for your work among us. Give us a heart for the lost around us. Father, we pray now that as we direct our hearts through uh, to the Lord's Supper now, be present to build up the hearts of your people, we pray. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.